Oh, you're here. Hello. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe. I am making this video to acknowledge the audiobook release of The Passenger by Ulrich Alexander Boschwitz from Macmillan Audio. Uh, the book is published by Metropolitan Books and Henry Holt, and in Germany, which is notable for reasons I'll explain in a little bit, from Kottische Buchendung, and it is translated by Philip Baim. Uh, I wanted to make a video to kind of lay out some of the things about this book that are rather unique uh, in terms of its its writer's history, its publication history, uh, and uh, and I want to read a little bit of it uh, for you as well so that you can get a sense of what it is about this particular book that um, I feel very fortunate to have the opportunity uh, to have narrated. So thanks to Macmillan Audio and Steve Wagner for that in particular, and, for, and to Philip Bain. Um, uh, so this book was written about 80 years ago. And um, for a while, it was considered sort of a, a lost novel. And then in 2019, it was published again and then has found its way to audio. Um, but to get kind of deeper into that, um, uh, Ulrich Alexander Boschwitz was born in 1915 in Germany. Um, and he lived in Berlin up until 1933, until the Nuremberg Laws were passed. And uh, he and his mother, uh, owing to their Jewish heritage, um, were fortunate enough to be able to leave Germany at that time, which was rather difficult for a lot of people to do, as this kind of comes as the story, basically the topic of this book. Um, he was able to leave and move to Sweden, where he wrote his first book at the age of 21, uh, and which apparently did pretty well. Um, then in 1938, um, in Germany, there was the event uh, known as Kristallnacht, which we now know is was, was based out of a fabricated incident regarding a German diplomat being assassinated by a Polish Jew. Um, in Germany in 38, um, SA troops and other irregulars um, burned synagogues, destroyed Jewish businesses. Jews were beaten, arrested, and worse. Uh, and this event had a profound effect on Boschwitz. And uh, right after that, in four weeks, he wrote what would become The Passenger, sort of an explosion of writing. Um, at the time, he'd been living in Sweden, but moving around to other different European countries. He lived in Paris for a while and um, eventually actually found his way to the UK, where he lived for a, a a good amount of time in a in sort of an internment camp for German refugees uh, in the, on the Isle of Man. And when he was there, he was able to get this book published um, in the UK under the title of The Man Who Took Trains, um, and actually in the US uh, under the title The Fugitive. Um, from there, his history gets even more unfortunate. Um, still considered a prisoner of war um, in, in, from this internment camp, um, he was sent to Australia aboard a ship called the Dunera, which is a whole other history in of itself, if you want to look up the Dunera boys. Um, it, was a, it was a boat packed with German refugees, both Nazi sympathizers and Jews, horrible conditions, atrocities performed by the Brits who sent them there. Uh, and then that took him to Australia for a few years um, in another kind of prison camp environment. So while he was there, he was able to do some significant revisions on this book. And his mother, who was still in the UK, um, he sent um, his, his mother, Marta, um, a letter saying that he had done revisions to the first 109 pages. He was sending them with another prisoner on a different boat, just in case, foreshadowing, um, tragically. And, uh, but that when she got those notes, she should take them to someone literary, someone who would knew what to do with them. It said it needed an editorial pass, but they, he, he felt the book had a lot of potential. Um, so unfortunately, uh, on another boat returning to the UK, the MV Abasso, um, on October 29th, 1942, when Boschwitz was 27 years old, that ship was torpedoed by U-575, and he and 361 other people on board were unfortunately killed. So, um, and to boot, the pages never made it to his mother. So um, those printings of the book in the UK and the US, not in Germany, he wanted it, there were attempts to have it published in Germany um, for obvious reasons that didn't happen in the short run, and then after that, hadn't hadn't happened in the long run. Um, skip ahead to 2015. Um, the editor of this particular edition, Peter Graf, who um, had done this before, he had taken lost novels and edited them and put them back out. Um, Peter Graf was approached by uh, Ruella Shachaf, who actually is Boschwitz's niece. Um, his sister, um, before the Nuremberg Laws were passed, actually um, left and left Germany and went to Palestine and lived on a kibbutz there. So um, Ruella Shachaf approached Peter Graf and said, I have, we found the original manuscript of Der Reisende, which means the, the, the traveler, um, uh, in, a, in a family attic in Frankfurt. 
And would you be interested in reviving this particular book as well, too? Um, Graf read it, um, you know, was completely blown away by it uh, and was able to um, get it published. And it's been published in 19 different languages around the world um, and in Germany by Kotosha Buchenlung, which is the important one. Um, so this lost novel is unique for that kind of history as well, too, but also in terms of what it talks about. And a lot of it takes from, as you can kind of hear, Boschwitz's life was all this kind of traveling around all over the place. Um, the main character of The Passenger, um, Otto Silber Silbermann, um, is sort of a stand-in for Boschwitz in many ways. Uh, a German Jew um, living in Berlin uh, right after Kristallnacht. Um, what, what this book really, it, it's a novel and, you know, it, it tells what is essentially a, a fictionalized story, but it contains all these different elements from Boschwitz's experience, from the experience of the people that he knew. Um, and what it really captures in, uh, in a very unique kind of way, and I'll get to exactly how in a moment, is the experience of a Jew living in Germany as everything is transforming ar around him. Uh, and in particular, Otto Silbermann, um, who is a rather well-to-do merchant, as Boschwitz's father was a well-to-do merchant, um, he doesn't uh, appear Jewish. So in a way, he kind of passes, as it were. There are other Jews who do not, and he encounters them. And there's all this in the book about Jews that look Jewish, Jews that don't look Jewish, and their varying fates and, um, and, and all the difficulties of navigating all of that, uh, along with um, all these portraits of all the, the other Germans around him. And you get to see all the different interactions he has with the whole range of everyday Germans uh, living through the same situation. Some of them are lifelong partners who suddenly realize they can take advantage of him financially. Some people go out of their way to help him. Some people are completely oblivious to the whole thing and living their own lives, despite everything that's happening around him. Um, what's for, for, you know, on a, on a personal level, um, uh, growing up Jewish and also in a certain sense, like growing up as a Jew who doesn't uh, appear to be Jewish, for whatever that means. Again, that's it's called out here is a tenet of racial scientists. It doesn't essentially mean anything, but um, it, uh, it it gives this kind of. You know, and this is something that I think maybe we can all kind of relate to when we're stuck in a moment of history and we kind of lose the forest for the trees, right? Um, we think we think, well, things are bad, but surely they can't get worse, and we never really know how bad things are going to get. And in this particular case, Silbermann is navigating not just um, he, he's called the passenger because he finds. Um, refuge on trains and travels all over the place, almost constantly from place to place, um, trying to figure out how to get out of Germany. Um, a lot of Silbermann's experiences here echo those of Boschwitz's traveling around Europe, trying to figure out what to do. Um, uh, down to you know a particular incident at the Belgian border that is happened to Boschwitz, happens to Silbermann as well, too. Uh, the other thing about this is that it... Um, it's 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 you know I've done a lot of um, nonfiction uh, about World War II from uh, all these different angles, and I've even done fictionalized uh, accounts of uh, families' uh, escapes um, from Nazi Germany um, or survival stories, basically. Um, this is very different from all those because it really has this kind of, and the publisher brought this to my attention, uh, a, a real absurdist bent to it. In fact, it actually has a pretty you know. Uh, it's dark, of course, but um, a, a real keen, absurdist, Kafkaesque sense of humor about it. Uh, it's kind of like if you can imagine, if you've ever read The, jo uh, the, the Prisoner um, by Kafka, um, Joseph K., the bureaucracy he faces, imagine if that bureaucracy was Nazis, <laughs> basically, is kind of what we're dealing with here. Um, but it, it affects the characterizations of the people around him. Um, the book is written in third person, but there's a lot of um, first person sections, and I want to read some of that to you so you can kind of hear it. Um, but in, in short, um, this has been a, on a personal level, you know, at the same exact time that Silbermann and Boschwitz were carting around Europe desperately trying to escape was the exact same time that my family was doing the same. So um, th I found a resonance because of that, um, but also just because um, for uh, such a young writer and to have written it so quickly, um, it's, it's, it's a remarkable book, if I may say. And um, I'd like to read a little bit of it for you. Um, so that you can get a little taste of it, and I hope you check it out, the book or the audiobook as well, too. I need to drink water. Okay. This is right near the beginning. This is kind of like, um, this is essentially what I sort of read to audition for this. Okay. The waiter Silbermann had been looking for earlier, without success, finally appeared. Are guests meant to wait for service here or for the trains? asked Silbermann. 
his sharp tone expressing his disdain for anything that approached slovenliness or exuded an unfriendly air. "'I beg your pardon,' answered the waiter. "'A gentleman in second class was complaining because he thought he was sitting across from a Jew, but it wasn't a Jew at all. The man was from South America, and since I know a little Spanish, I was called in to help.' "'I see.' Sorbermann got up, his mouth contracted into a line, and his gray eyes fixed the waiter with a severe look. The waiter tried to smooth things over. "'It really wasn't a Jew,' he assured Silberman. Evidently, the waiter considered his guest to be a particularly staunch member of the party. "'I'm not interested in that. Has the train for Hamburg already left?' The waiter glanced at the clock above the exit to the platforms. Seven thirty, he thought out loud. "'The train for Magdeburg is just leaving. Hamburg leaves at 7.24. If you hurry, you can still make it. I wish that some day I could go running to catch a train, but people like me—' He brushed a few breadcrumbs off the table with a napkin. "'The best would be,' he went on, picking up the previous conversation, "'if the Jews had to wear yellow bands on their arms, then at least there wouldn't be any confusion.' Silberman looked at him. "'Are they really so terrible?' he asked quietly, regretting his words even as he spoke them. The waiter looked at Silberman as though he hadn't understood him right. He was clearly surprised, but also unsuspecting since Silbermond had none of the features that marked him as a Jew, according to the tenets of the racial scientists. "'The whole thing has nothing to do with me,' the man said at last, carefully. "'Still, it would be good for the others. My brother-in-law, for example, looks a little Jewish, but of course he's an Aryan. It's only that he has to constantly explain and prove everything over and over. That's too much to ask of anyone.' "'Yes, it is,' Silbermond agreed. Then he paid his tab and left. Unbelievable, he thought. Absolutely unbelievable. After leaving the train station, he climbed into a taxi and headed home. The streets were full of people, many in uniform. Newsboys were hawking their papers, and Silberman had the impression they were doing a brisk business. For a moment, he considered buying one for himself, but then decided against it, since he figured the news was bound to be bad, and almost certainly hostile, at least as far as he was concerned. He would undoubtedly be experiencing it all firsthand soon enough. After a short ride, the taxi pulled up in front of his building. Frau Friedrich, the wife of the concierge, was lingering in the stairwell. She greeted him politely, and Silberman was somehow glad to see that her behavior remained unchanged. As he stepped onto the red plush runner and climbed the stairs, he once again had the sensation that his life was only half real. Recently such ruminations had become a habit. I'm living as though I weren't a Jew, he thought, somewhat incredulously. For the time being, I'm simply a well-to-do citizen, under threat, it's true, but as of yet unscathed. How is this possible? I live in a modern six-room apartment. People talk to me and treat me as though I were one of them. They act as if I'm the same person I used to be, the liars. It's enough to give a man a guilty conscience. Whereas I'd like to show them a clearer picture of reality, namely that as of yesterday, I'm something different because I'm a Jew. And who did I used to be? No, who am I? What am I, really? A swear words on two legs, one that people mistake for something else. I no longer have any rights, and it's only out of propriety or habit that so many act as though I did. My entire existence is based solely on the faulty memory of people who essentially wish to destroy it. They just happen to have forgotten about me. I've been officially degraded, but the public debasement has yet to take place. Frau Zankel, the counselor's widow, was just stepping out of her apartment. Silberman doffed his hat and greeted her with a... Guten Tag, Gnädige Frau. How are you doing? she asked kindly. I'm fine, by and large. And yourself? Tolerably well, for an old lady. She held out her hand in parting. These must be difficult times for you, she added regretfully. Terrible times. Silberman contented himself with an attentive little smile that was both cautious and thoughtful, neither agreeing nor disagreeing. "'In essence, we've been assigned a peculiar role,' he said at last. "'But they're great times, too,' she consoled him. "'There's no doubt that you're being treated unjustly, but that's exactly why you need to be fair-minded and compassionate in your thinking.' 
Isn't that a lot to ask, Gnadega Frau? Besides, I, I don't think at all anymore. I've given that up. It's the best way to deal with everything. They'll never do anything to you, she assured him, and banged the umbrella she was clenching in her right hand resolutely on a stair, as if to signal that she wouldn't allow anyone to get too close to him. Then she gave him an encouraging nod and stepped on by. That's a little sample for you. Um, I hope you enjoy that. Please check out the rest of the book. Uh, it's available... Um, from places where audiobooks are sold as well. Thanks again to Macmillan. Thanks to Steve Wagner for the opportunity. Thanks to Philip Bain for all of his work. Beautiful work as well, too. And um, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Take care.